So whatever happened to the spaceship from the Planet of the Apes movies and TV shows? Let's find out. Movies, music, and monsters. Hey guys, Dan Monroe here talking about movies, music, and monsters. Okay, folks, buckle up. This is gonna be a good one. Not only is this classic Hollywood prop an amazing piece of sci-fi history, but also an incredibly beloved and heavily researched piece of Planet of the Apes fandom. Over the years, this ship and the history of this ship has literally become legendary. Now, before we get started, I have to give a huge shout out and special thanks to everyone over at Hunter's Planet of the Apes Archives, and especially to Susan Cunningham, Jim Key, Rob McFarlane, and the late Phil Broad for their extremely well-researched and thorough information that, in part, allows me to share this incredible story with you guys. There's a ton of information here from a lot of different people over the years who supplied photographs and historical information, and apologies in advance if I left anybody out, that clearly was never my intention. Now, before we start the deep dive into the incredible history of this amazing full-scale prop, we have to talk about the name. And I know I'm probably going to get into a whole bunch of trouble for this, but the ship had no name. However, it was given several unofficial names over the years. The ship was originally unofficially named Immigrant One in an early Charles Eastman draft of the script from late 1966. Believe it or not, it was also unofficially called Air Force One in the set of Tops Planet of the Apes trading cards. The unofficial name of Icarus actually just came from a fan, and that fan-given name became so popular within the Planet of the Apes community that it just stuck. Now, in 2008, in the bonus features from the Planet of the Apes box set on Blu-ray, suddenly it was called Liberty One. But for the purposes of historical accuracy and throughout the course of this video, I'll simply be referring to the prop as either the ship from Planet of the Apes, or at best, Taylor's ship. This incredible Planet of the Apes spaceship was designed by Oscar-winning art director and production designer William Krieber. This guy was nominated for not one, but three Academy Awards in the category of Best Art Direction for The Greatest Story Ever Told, The Poseidon Adventure, and The Towering Inferno. He designed not only the flying sub from Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, but also the interiors of the Jupiter II from Lost in Space. When we chose Utah and the cliffs and, and the geography of Utah was, was stark in its own way, what we wanted to do is create a spaceship that also looked very foreign to that. So we wanted it to not be fluid or rounded. We wanted it to be very angular built the set of metal because we knew we had to put it into the water at Lake Powell. So we took it up to Lake Powell, assembled it, and took it out to a site which we had previously picked and anchored it in about 300 feet of water. He was thrilled to finally get the opportunity to work on something that wasn't a flying saucer and create something that looked a little bit more like real-world technology. In a interview with Bill Krieber, conducted by Jim Key, Bill did a number of sketches after which corrections were made and a four-foot miniature was created. And here's an amazing photo of the original maquette miniature provided by Bill Krieber's son, Ken. How cool is that? And contrary to what a lot of people think, there was only one full-size ship built and used four times throughout the Planet of the Apes history. And hey guys, I wanted to give a quick plug out for my kid who has his own YouTube page dedicated to the spookier things in life. Ghosts, ghouls, or pretty much anything paranormal. His channel is just getting off the ground, but if you guys like that kind of stuff, show some love and take a look. Beyond the Hub Podcast. 
Link in the description. Thanks, guys. The ship was originally designed to be a whopping 45 feet long from the tip to the jets and 24 feet wide. I mean, this thing was big. According to Phil Broad, who was lucky enough to examine the remains of this ship back in 1974, the prop was welded steel with not one, but two layers of 1 16th inch sheet steel for skin a large steel frame, and also a wooden frame inside for supporting the mortar device, which blew off the hatch in the first movie. The production team constructed a ballast tank inside the ship, right below the water line, which was designed to hold enough water weight to weigh the ship down while keeping the upper portion of the ship out of the water. And special thanks to Jim Key for this amazing high-resolution scan of the original plans for this ship. The ship was so large that it had to be built in sections to be transported out to Lake Powell and then reassembled on site. Lake Powell, by the way, is on the border between Arizona and Utah and is the body that was formed behind the Glen Canyon Dam. This amazing sequence during the opening segment of Planet of the Apes was not only spectacular, but certainly not the last time we would see this incredible prop. On a side note, all of the interiors of the various incarnations of this ship were filmed separately on sound stages. This was kind of surprising, and I never knew this, but apparently in 1969, only one year after Planet of the Apes, this full-size prop was used in the movie The Illustrated Man in the second segment called The Long Rain. Now, moving on to Beneath the Planet of the Apes in 1970, we see the beloved ship once again. This time, the entire front end of the prop is identical to the way it was in the original Planet of the Apes, but featured an extended rear section which allowed us to see the extensive wreckage from Brent's crash. This is super interesting. At first, Bill Kreber originally envisioned that Brent's ship would land successfully upright on its legs. It was only later, due to revisions of the script, that they decided to go instead with a crash landing. Kinda cool, if you look really close in the exterior wreckage of the ship, you can see the three landing gear that were used on the full-size Jupiter 2 prop from Lost in Space. Super cool. Other than this one segment, we didn't get to see very much of the spaceship in this film, but it was really cool to see it for a second time, but again, not the last time. This classic ship made its third appearance in the Apes franchise in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. For this film, the body of the ship was significantly reduced by removing the entire rear jet engine section. The removal of the tail section reduced the overall length of the ship by about 12 feet, but the addition of the heat shield added two feet back on, making this new shorter version of the ship about 35 feet long. This new heat shield was basically a large metal outer ring assembly with a fiberglass shell for the shield itself. Now, rather than exiting the ship through the circular hatch the way the astronauts did in the first two films, a side gull wing hatch was added to the prop to make it a little bit easier for the actors inside to exit the ship. This is interesting and maybe even a little bizarre, but when they were filming the opening sequence to escape and they put the ship in the water, the tow line broke and this amazing prop just sort of drifted away. Well, drifted away might not actually be the best way to describe it. It was heavily damaged, breaking off the nose cone completely and denting up the bottom of the ship as it was literally crashing into the rocks. I wonder where the guy in charge of that ship ended up working the next day. You can literally see a lot of the damage on the bottom of the ship in the movie as they're transporting the ship on the back of an army truck. Now, when it came to the 1974 Planet of the Apes TV series, very few, if any, changes were made to the ship other than the fact that they dragged it out to the Fox Ranch. 
And this first episode, entitled Escape from Tomorrow, was sadly the prop's last on-screen appearance. Okay, but what happened to the ship after that? Well, after the conclusion of the Planet of the Apes TV show, the ship was left to the mercy of Mother Nature in an outside storage yard on the Fox backlot. In January of 1974, the Fox Ranch was purchased by the state of California and opened as a public parkland called Malibu Creek Park. And because of this, the Fox Ranch would have to be cleared of any and all movie sets or props before the state takeover in 1976. Around 1973 or 1974, Phil Broad and Rob McFarland visited the 20th Century Fox Construction Department off Olympic Boulevard in Century City to see one of the final resting places of this amazing historical property. And there it was. When they saw the ship, they claimed that structurally the prop was in fairly good condition, mostly due to the fact that it was almost an entirely steel construction. But it did show signs of obvious weather wear and the side hatch was completely rusted shut. And, by any chance, do you happen to notice what other classic Planet of the Apes prop is sitting right next to Taylor's ship? Well, you should. It's the Doomsday Bomb from beneath the Planet of the Apes. I already did a video on this amazing prop. Check it out. Link in the description. Now, in either late 1975 or early 76, Jim Opperly and Steven Serkis took this amazing photo of the full-size prop at the Fox Ranch. Absolutely spectacular. So, that was it, right? Oh, well, not exactly. You know, some props are saved, some props are thrown out, and some historical props end up as giant signs for hotels in Utah. Yep, you heard me right. In 1978, a photographer named Walter Cotton took these amazing photographs of the spaceship from Planet of the Apes currently being used as a Four Seasons in sign in Kanab, Utah. A sign in Utah. And yes, despite what some people might think and spend time arguing about for days in the comment section, this is the ship from Planet of the Apes. There is no question. These amazing photos were brought to the public by Apes fan Bill Ritchie back in 2016. You can even still see the damage from the rocks on the bottom of the ship. Well, eventually, and sadly, the ship was blown over in a storm and ended up in Goodfellas Junkyard, just northeast of Kanab. <sighs> a junkyard. This was the last known photo of the ship ever taken, published in the Southern Utah News on Thursday, July 7th, 1983. Now, the four-foot model that was used in the shots of the ship sinking in the lake was eventually restored for Bill Krieber by the master model maker Greg Jean, who sadly just passed away a couple of years ago. But it's still around, and it still looks awesome. Whew, so that's it. That is the entire history of the one and only classic spaceship prop from the Planet of the Apes franchise. But wait, what about all the beautiful interiors of the ship? You know, the ones that were filmed on the other sound stages? There were some amazing and beautiful full-scale interior sets that were made for filming the various movies and TV shows from Planet of the Apes over the years, but that, my friends, is the topic of another video. I really hope you enjoyed that very deep dive into the ship from Planet of the Apes, and if you did and you like this kind of stuff, please consider subscribing to the channel. I've got a whole bunch of new videos coming up that I know you guys are just gonna dig. And if anybody has any questions, as always, drop them in the comments and I will do my best to try to answer them for you. And feel free to stop back anytime as we continue our conversation on movies, music, 
and monsters. Movies, music, and monsters. 